2 Kings 19. We are going to continue our message series, The Battle for Reformation, The Life of King Hezekiah. This is our fourth part together going through his life. So we have said in this series that the church is in need of reformation in every generation. We are a church that is reformed, but we are always supposed to be reformed by the Word of God. In every generation, we should go back to the Scriptures, put ourselves under the covenant of God, and be changed by His Word. And we have said that Reformation is battle. It is warfare. It is an assault against sin and wrong beliefs and examining our lives according to Scripture. And we have seen the battle of Reformation through the life of King Hezekiah. We spent time seeing it begins with the grace of God. It overthrows the idols in our life. It breaks unholy alliances in our lives. And now today, uh, we come into a situation that is quite grave. Brother Frank gave us an excellent message last week, setting us up. The world's superpower, the king of Assyria, Sennacherib, has been on a spree conquering nations. And when Hezekiah chose to lead Judah to rebel against the Assyrian Empire, we read about how he marched into Judah. He conquered many villages and cities. He brought 185,000 people to surround the capital city of Jerusalem with plans to conquer it and overthrow it. In contrast to the 185,000 soldiers of the Assyrians, we read when the king of Assyria was taunting God's people in their midst of reform that Judah barely had 2,000 men available to get on a horse and ride out and go to war. So we could say the situation today was hopeless and helpless. It was desperate and quite impossible feeling. It was not a laughing matter at all. So last week we saw that Hezekiah had messengers go to Isaiah the prophet first to hear a word from God. And then he went to the temple and prayed for deliverance and glory. And now as we come into chapter 19, verse 20, we are going to see that God is going to answer Hezekiah through the prophet Isaiah. So what does God do in the midst of this reformation? It's an interesting thing. God laughs at this situation. God laughs. So today we're going to look at reformation and the laughter of God. He answers with a taunt, a mocking song. Most scholars say the words are we're about to read. And then he takes action on behalf of his people. Let me ask you, have you ever been at your absolute wits end with someone? You've tried to help them over and over and over again, only to be pushed away, to be uh, made fun of, to be mocked, to give your all trying to rescue them from a poisonous attitude and self-damaging actions, only to have them reject you again and again. And your love for them has led to tears crying for them and bewilderment at their crazy behavior their insanity in the way they continue on on a path that you can clearly see is leading to their own destruction. And then your tears have led you to shaking your head and even laughing at the recklessness of their behavior. What is God to do with such wicked people in the world when he has showed them his mercy and his grace time and time again? And yet time and time again, they continue to despise him. And then the father gives his only son, Jesus Christ, as a sacrifice. What more could you want him to do? Could you blame God if he responded with laughter, almost with a taunt of mocking at those who are his enemies? Now, the word laugh that's used in the Bible when speaking of God does not mean laughing as in joy. Or making a joke of, like we would say someone laughs at somebody else. It means to hold in derision, to mock or to scorn. In fact, the Hebrew word could probably best be translated to laugh mockingly. We read three times in the Psalms where God laughs 
at those who continue to rebel against him. For instance, in Psalm chapter 2, you see the picture of nations gathering together, and they are going to try to overthrow God in his plans. And we read there, He who sits in the heavens laughs, and the Lord holds them in derision. In other words, God isn't afraid or confused or depressed about the opposition he is facing. He does not even get up out of his chair where he is sitting. Instead, he simply laughs at this foolishness. Or how about Psalm 37? The wicked plots against the righteous and gnashes his teeth at him. That's what we've seen in this series. Sennacherib and his servant, the Rabshakeh, have mocked and gnash their teeth at Hezekiah and the people of God. But notice what the Lord does. It says, The Lord laughs at the wicked, for he sees that his day is coming. Now, I want to be clear here that we often hear people laughing and joking about sin, and God does not laugh or joke at sin. He sent his only son to die on the cross and pay the wrath of God for our sin. God does not laugh when people suffer either. We do not see that in the Bible. When Jesus was suffering on the cross being mocked, he said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. God has tremendous compassion for lost people, for hurting people. However, if a person will be so brazen as to reject God and his mercy and his grace and his patience... And his offer of salvation time and time again. Yes, God laughs at that man or woman. For the Lord knows his day is coming. Or we could say it this way. If you keep defying the living God, God always gets the last laugh. So today we are going to consider reformation and the laughter of God. Hear with me the word of the Lord, 2 Kings 19, beginning at verse 20. Scripture says, Then Isaiah, the son of Amos, sent to Hezekiah, saying, Thus says Yahweh, God of Israel, because you have prayed to me against Sennacherib, king of Assyria, I have heard. This is the word which the Lord has spoken concerning him. Now, you'll notice if you have a modern translation, all of this is set off in a poetic form. Again, this has been called a laughing song or a taunting song that God speaks to his enemy. The virgin, the daughter of Zion, has despised you, has laughed you to scorn. The daughter of Jerusalem has shaken her head behind your back. Whom have you reproached and blasphemed? Against whom have you raised your voice and lifted up your eyes on high? Against the Holy One of Israel. By your messengers you have reproached the Lord and said, By the multitude of my chariots I have come up to the height of the mountains, to the limits of Lebanon. I will cut down its tall cedars and its choice cypress trees. I will enter the extremity of its borders to its fruitful forest. I have dug and drunk strange water. And with the soles of my feet, I have dried up all the brooks of defense. Did you not hear long ago how I made it from ancient times that I formed it? Now I have brought it to pass that you should be for crushing fortified cities into heaps of ruins. Therefore, their inhabitants had little power. They were dismayed and confounded. They were as the grass of the field and the green herb, as the grass on the housetops, and grain blighted before it is grown. But I know your dwelling place. You're going out and you're coming in and your rage against me. Because your rage against me and your tumult have come up to my ears, therefore I will put my hook in your nose and my bridle in your lips, and I will turn you back by the way which... You came. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So now Isaiah responds to the prayers of King Hezekiah. He responds to the message that King Hezekiah had sent him. We see here a prophet is a spokesman for God. 
God, from his mind, reveals a word to the prophet, and the prophet delivers the word to the people of God. He says, because you have prayed, I have heard. I love this. In other words, the prayers of God's people are like the metal, and God is like a magnet that draws those prayers, those cries to himself. He is like a parent in a crowded room, a noisy room with tons of children running around, maybe like our after service time every Sunday morning. And that parent can tune out all the background noise, the kids wanting to get up on the percussion and play the piano and run back and forth on the stage and run the aisles. And that parent can hear that one voice of their child. And that is exactly what happens when the people of God cry out to him in prayer. He can sift through all the noise and he hears the voices of his children. Exodus 22 speaks of it this way. You shall not wrong a sojourner or oppress him, for you were sojourners in the land of Egypt. You shall not mistreat any widow or fatherless child. Why? If you mistreat them and they cry out to me, I will surely hear their cry. So this is so amazing. Hezekiah prays. God is like a magnet drawing in the cries of his people. He hears and he answers indeed. And this glorious answer, which fills the rest of this chapter, is because of Hezekiah's prayer. So look, we believe God is sovereign. God ordains the ends to everything. God is not surprised by what's going on in the world. But understand this. I want you to hear this. God does not just ordain the ends. He ordains the means to the ends. And the means is prayer. Prayer is the means to getting the results that God has in his plan. And so let me ask you a question. What if Hezekiah had not prayed? How many times have we not prayed when we should have prayed? You see, it was the prayer of Hezekiah that leads to the laughter of God and the response to this wicked king and his desire for the destruction of the people of God. I love what the Puritan writer Thomas Brooks said. He said, a family without prayer is like a house without a roof, open and exposed to all the storms of heaven. Wow, that should make us pause, shouldn't it? Prayer is the means to the ends that God has ordained. D.A. Carson, in his book on spiritual reformation, has said, It matters little whether you are the mother of active children who drain away your energy, or an important executive in a major multinational corporation, or if you're a graduate student cramming for an impending comprehensive, or if you're a plumber working overtime to put your children through college, or even if you're a pastor of a large church putting in 90-hour weeks, at the end of the day, if you are too busy to pray, you are too busy. Let me say that again. In the end of the day, if you are too busy to pray, you are too busy, cut something out. This is the importance of prayer. God answers because his people are faithful to pray. Now notice verse 21. This is the word which the Lord has spoken concerning Sennacherib, concerning the king of Assyria, the enemy of God, the enemy of God's people. Notice he calls Hezekiah and the people of Jerusalem, the people of Reformation, a term here that is quite beautiful and endearing and encouraging. He says in verse 21, Jerusalem, you are the virgin, the daughter of Zion. And, and Sennacherib, the daughter of Zion, has despised you and laughed you to scorn. What is going on in this language? God is saying, my people are like a young woman to me. They are like a young, precious daughter to me. Now, listen, all fathers love their sons. All mothers love their sons. But there is something about a young daughter who often knows how to get her way better than sons do. Right? I don't know what it is. It's just something that God put in the water. Okay? It's the way it goes down a lot. And so God chooses the picture of a tender young daughter when he is talking about his people, Jerusalem. 
He is saying here, Sennacherib, you are an enemy. Assyria, you hate my people. You have come to violate my people. But my people are laughing at you. And this is a very insulting statement because he's not saying my mighty warriors, my King Hezekiah with sword and shield and army is mocking you. He's saying the little girls in Jerusalem are laughing at you, my enemy. They are scorning you. In Isaiah 61, we see the same language speaking of the people of God. He says there, say to the daughter of Zion, your salvation is coming. And then he says, you are called my holy people. You are the redeemed of Yahweh. You are a people that I have sought out. And you are a city that will not be forsaken. God loves his children. We are not simply Christians. We are family. We are sons and daughters of the King of Kings. In the hard work of reformation, remember, you have a father who will enable you and protect you and help you through it. Amen. You're not doing this on your own. The great messianic prophecy fulfilled in the New Testament in Zechariah 9, on the triumphal entry of Jesus, says, Rejoice greatly, daughter of Zion, why your king is coming humbly on a donkey. He is bringing salvation to you. In other words, when we read these promises, we see we are not God's enemies. We are his children, his loved ones. And the Assyrians thought that they were taking on the people of God, but they forgot that the people of God have an omnipotent, all-powerful father who will protect his daughter from the attacks of the enemy. Assyria came to rape and pillage and destroy. And the picture here is of a young woman, a young girl, pre-puberty, 10 years old, 6 years old, mocking the mighty Assyrian king. He came to rape and pillage her, and God will protect her. This reminds me of the statement of the great prime minister of England, Winston Churchill. He said, there is nothing more exhilarating than to be shot at with no result. It was like at this moment, all the forces of hell had surrounded the people of God, and it was so bleak and dark. And all of a sudden, the little girl comes out and laughs at the enemies of God. She mocks these enemies. God's people will not be touched by this enemy. The daughter of Jerusalem shakes her head behind her back. This is basically saying, Assyria, you're going to run away like a dog with its tail between its legs. Kind of reminds me, I've got one of these mutant dogs at home called a chihuahua. And that thing is tough until you stomp your foot or clap your hands and it takes off running. The young women of Jerusalem are more powerful than the greatest emperor on the earth with God present. Isn't that beautiful? That is a beautiful promise we read here. God says, you have reproached me. You have blasphemed me. You have defied me and insulted me. You haven't just spoken against my earthly king, Hezekiah. You haven't just insulted my people. You've insulted me, the living God, the king of kings and Lord of lords. Listen, when you, church, are insulted, remember what Jesus said. When you do it to the least of these, my family, my brothers, you have done it to me. When someone comes against you, they are coming against God. They are coming against your Father in heaven. These people foolishly, absurdly had blasphemed God's name. We saw that in previous sermons. We know what the law of God says. You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. Commandment number three. Why? For the Lord will not hold him guiltless who takes his name in vain. Let's think about this for a minute. Statements like, O oh God... My God, oh my God, good heavens, good God, gosh darn it, what the heck, good Lord, I swear to God. How about, let me really convict someone on your social media or on your texting, OMG, you slam your finger in the door and you say, Jesus Christ, or GD, which by the way, God's last name is not damn, just to clarify God takes seriously when we invoke his name wrongfully. 
Part of reformation is treating his name rightfully with the honor and glory it deserves. And some of us may need to reform our lives on this point. Not using God's name flippantly, haphazardly, casually, but with reverence and respect and love and worship. That's exactly what the enemies of God do. They mock God's name. And now God is going to mock them. He is going to laugh at them. He gives illustrations of this in verses 23 and 24. He says, over and over, Sennacherib, you said, I have, I will, I have, I will. He'd only been emperor three years, and he had achieved a lot. Basically, Sennacherib said, mountains do not stop me. I cross them, even in my chariots. Deserts do, my stop, do not stop me. I'll dig wells in the deserts and drink water. Rivers do not stop me. I pass them as easily as if they were dry land. He gave no credit to all of his military victories to anyone but himself. Not to his army, not to his people, and definitely not to the God of the heavens. He thought he was exactly what his press report said. Friends, he had forgotten the message that Jonah had given to Nineveh. Remember, Nineveh was the capital city of Assyria just a generation earlier. Jonah had called on Nineveh and the Assyrians to repent or God will judge you. And now, a generation later, pride has filled the heart of the Assyrians in a terrible way. This is exactly like the stories we read in the Old Testament. For instance, the time of Daniel, when Nebuchadnezzar the king went out on the roof of his palace in Babylon And he said, is not this great Babylon, which I have built by my mighty power as a residence and the glory of my majesty. Just like some of you said, when you built your own house, when you bought that new car, when you got that promotion, when your kids graduated and had that picture opportune moment, you said, Aren't I something great? You believed your own press. Instead of humbly recognizing, yes, we work as if everything depends on us, but we pray and we trust knowing everything actually depends on God. Right? Attempt great things from God. Expect great things from God. And so, what did God do? In God's power, immediately, God made Nebuchadnezzar insane and made him as if an animal in the pastures of Babylon for a period of time in judgment. Or how about in the New Testament, when Herod believed his own press? In Acts 12, he put on royal robes and he took his seat among the people and he gave them a speech, an oration, And the people were shouting to him, the voice of a God and not a man. And immediately an angel of the Lord struck him down because he did not give God the glory. And he was eaten by worms and breathed his last, which does not sound too pleasant to me. Brothers and sisters, we must be so careful to not blasphemously take the credit that goes to God. One of the pillars of the Reformation is soli Deo Gloria, glory to God alone. God is jealous for his glory. If your kids are doing well, yes, you might have worked hard, and we congratulate you for that in an earthly way. But don't forget to thank God who is merciful. If you're doing well in business right now, don't forget to thank God who is merciful because there's many who are not. There's many parents whose kids are struggling, who are godly parents. There's many godly businessmen and women who've lost everything in the last couple years. Don't think that it's because of your press that things are going the way they are going. You need to look to God. One man sows the seed, another waters it. It is only God who gives the increase. It is dangerous territory to steal from God what is due. And so he says in verse 25, did you not hear from long ago? I made it. I formed it. I brought it to pass. I know your dwelling place. You see, God is sovereign. God is omniscient. God had orchestrated the victories of Assyria, not Assyria at all. And so now the taunting, the laughter of God continues in verse 28. 
He says there, therefore, I will put my hook in your nose and my bridle bit in your lips. Now, Brother Frank and I have both referenced this expression in previous messages, but in case you missed it or uh, just don't remember, I want to explain to you the language that is going on here. The Assyrian people were notoriously barbaric when they conquered other cities and nations. This is why Jonah, when called upon God to go to the capital city of Nineveh, got in a boat and went in the other direction. Because these were horrible, cruel people. They were vile people as a culture and a society. It's a reminder that where the grace of God is not found in a culture, that culture can go deeper into depravity and sin. Where the word of God and the law of God is not found in a society, it can go deeper into sin. I remember some Christians a while back who were taking great offense at the idea that uh, America could have a better culture than other nations of the world. Now, I am not a believer at all in American exceptionalism. I know our sin stinks just as bad as everyone else's sin in the nostril of God. But we do need to recognize something, that there is something called grace, and that God's law does change peoples and nations. And so our goal should be to see God's law change peoples and nations and influence them. And when you look at a nation like Assyria, it's safe to say their culture was far more wicked than Judah's culture was. It was depraved. And what they would do because of their rejection of the God of the world is they would take a ring and they would pierce it through the flesh of the noses of their prisoners. And they would lead them with a rope or a chain like they were. Now, this was not, by the way, in fashion. Okay, just to let you know, it's in fashion now for some people, but it was not in fashion a couple thousand years ago. This was a statement of humiliation and judgment, okay? So they would have this huge ring pierced through their nose, and no one today at least has this part. They would put a chain on them, and then they would make the kings and the rulers drag them like livestock, like an animal, to dehumanize them and humiliate them. They would drag them back, to whatever land they would put them in exile and treating them as livestock. In fact, this is exactly what the Assyrians had just done a few chapters earlier to the northern kingdom of Israel. This is what they will do, the Babylonians will do later in 2 Chronicles 33 to Manasseh. We read there that they captured Manasseh with hooks and then they bound him with chains of bronze and brought him to Babylon. They, they hooked his nose. And you see this in ancient reliefs like I have pictured on the screen. I mean, this was a common practice of them. So Sennacherib has not just conquered people in horrible ways. He has humiliated them, dehumanized them. God hates it when we dehumanize people. We are made in his image and likeness. And so God says, as you have been so prideful to resist me, and to oppose my people, I am now going to humiliate you in the same way. What does Peter say? First Peter 5, God resists the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. Do not dehumanize others. Do not torture others. Listen, there is a problem for many people in the church and in our country of dehumanizing. Now, I don't mean the, the PC conversation on this. I mean husbands who verbally dehumanize their wives day after day and wives who verbally dehumanize their husbands with assaults verbally, daily, with children who are so battered and broken emotionally and spiritually because of the way they are talked to and treated by teachers, by superiors, by friends. Some of you students in the room today, you listen to this, all right? What you say to other students might lead them to depression, anxiety, brokenness. Words matter, all right? I know you're not going to pierce their nose through and drag them with a chain, but you can do the same thing with your words and your verbiage. You can assault them and break them. Friends, we need to recognize that God has called us to be salt and light. Now, yes, light can blind people who are in darkness, and it might hurt them for a minute, but ultimately they can see. Yes, salt going into wounds is a preservatory and a healer, and it might burn, but ultimately it's going to heal them. 
We are not called to simply rip people to shreds. Remember that. We are called to give them the truth. Sometimes the truth will hurt. But we are not trying to destroy them. We are trying to destroy their arguments and see them renewed in the image and likeness of God. I think that is a good word for all of us to think about today. Now, let's continue reading verses 29 to 31. This shall be a sign to you. You shall eat this year such as grows of itself, and the second year what springs from the same. And in the third year you will sow and reap and plant vineyards and eat the fruit of them. And the remnant who have escaped of the house of Judah shall again take root downward and bear fruit upward. For out of Jerusalem shall go a remnant And those who escape from Mount Zion, the zeal of Yahweh of armies of hosts will do this. God's going to give a sign, a verification. He's not going to fail his people. Now remember, Sennacherib, Assyrian army, they've conquered much of the known world. 185,000 soldiers surrounding the city of Jerusalem. The Rabshakeh, the messenger, mocking trying to cause doubt, depression, fear, anxiety, hopelessness in the people's minds and hearts. They are afraid that this army is going to hang around outside the city of Jerusalem and they will starve to death. You know, Hezekiah is fearing he won't make it three months with this army surrounding him. He is fearful. Now, I don't know if you've ever had to go and like had your body starve for a period of time. You know, some of us in this room are just ready for lunch already, okay? Like, it's been two hours since I've eaten last. But imagine going a month, and now there's no crops left. There's no food left. Two months, now your kids can't eat. There's nothing left. Three months, you're emaciated. That's what could have happened to this nation who is doing the work of reformation to the people of God. Though Jerusalem is surrounded, they will not be defeated by famine. Remember what the Rabshakeh said in 2 Kings 18, 27? He was trying to scorn the people of God in hateful language. He said, uh, the king of Assyria sent me to the men of their own wall to tell them they're going to eat their own waste and drink their own urine. Pretty harsh language. That's what he said, trying to put fear in the minds of the people. And I love how God speaks peace into the midst of war and fear. He says, look, the second year, this year you're going to have food. The second year you're going to have food, Jerusalem. And the third year, you're going to have an abundance of crops. You're not going to starve. I will supply all your needs. Be faithful to God. He will meet your needs according to his riches and glory. Don't doubt. There will be a remnant from my people, from the line of Hezekiah and David, Even though the northern kingdom of Israel is gone because of their sin, I will keep my covenant with my people. And verse 31 says, The zeal of the Lord of hosts will accomplish this. The love of God for his church will accomplish. If God be for us, Paul says, who can be against us? God will be faithful to his own. If you have a lack today. Today, if you are fearful, today, if you don't know the future, hear the word of the Lord. If God be for you, who can be against you? The zeal of the Lord of hosts will confirm this. Look at verses 32 to 34. Therefore, thus says Yahweh, concerning the king of Assyria, he will not come into this city. He will not shoot an arrow there, nor come before it with a shield. He will not build a siege mound against it. By the way he came, he will return. He will not come into the city, says Yahweh, for I will defend this city to save it for my own sake and for my servant David's sake. I love this here. David has been dead for almost 300 years, and yet God is saying, look, 
I'm bringing a savior into the world. He's coming from the line of David. Hezekiah is a king in the line of David. I'm not giving up on my people. What I've promised, I'm going to keep. I am going to save Jerusalem. And today God says, I am going to save my people. Romans 8, those whom he foreknew, he predestinated. Those he predestinated, he also called. Those he called, he also justified. Those he justified, he will also glorify. Jonah 2, salvation is of the Lord. He's not given up. He's not done. It doesn't matter how messy the situation is, how dark the skyline looks. The light of Christ shines in the darkest life and changes it forever. Amen. It's beautiful here. I will save my people for my sake, for my glory, and because of my promise to David. For David's sake, God's not done with his people. So let's look at how this passage concludes in our last moments. Look at verses 35 to 37. It's very strong language. It came to pass on a certain night that the angel of Yahweh went out and he killed in the camp of the Assyrians 185,000. And when people arose early in the morning, there were corpses all dead. So Sennacherib, king of Assyria, departed and went away. He returned home and he remained at Nineveh, his capital, and it came to pass, as he was worshiping in the temple of Nisroch, his god, that his sons, Adramelech and Sherezar, struck him down with the sword. And they went and escaped into the land of Ararat. Then Asharadun, his son, reigned in his place. What a terrifying passage to read. A single terrifying night. Just like the Passover in Exodus chapter 12, you remember Egypt defied the living God over and over and over again. Pharaoh treated himself as if he was God in pride and blasphemy. He defied the words of God. His heart was hard against the true God. And so the night of the Passover on the last plague of Egypt, the angel of Yahweh went out and brought devastation to the Egyptian nation. This is a stunning display of God's power, causing the mightiest superpower in the world to withdraw without a battle ever being fought. It's interesting in the historical records, two things to point out. Number one, we read in the Assyrian Chronicles that Sennacherib had destroyed 46 cities of Judah and had made Hezekiah like a bird in a cage, quote, but they never boast over defeating Jerusalem, which I would say is a sure sign that God delivered the city, as the Bible says. Now, you know that Assyrians and Babylonians and Persians never recorded their defeats. Egyptians, they only recorded their victories, right? So what's interesting is, for some reason, the Assyrians skip over whatever happened to old Hezekiah in Jerusalem. They never talk about it after that. And then we have in an Egyptian chronicle... A story given by Herodotus, who is a historian, that during the night there was a plague that broke out in the Assyrian army and defeated them, rendering them useless, and they fled away. I would say to you, while this story sounds hard to believe to skeptical minds, this is not just a story. This is the word of the living God. Amen. So... Just if God can speak the world into existence out of nothing, God can bring this kind of a sober judgment. Remember, we often exalt the mercy of God in 20 and 21. We are very uncomfortable exalting the justice of God. But these people had pillaged, raped, murdered, killed thousands, millions all around the world in a dehumanizing way. Yahweh passed before Moses in Exodus 34, and he said, Yahweh, Yahweh, I am a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness, keeping love, steadfast love for thousands, and forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin. We love that part, but we forget the second half. But will by no means clear the guilty, visiting the sin of the fathers on the children and the children's children to the third and fourth generation. 
I read this today, and I know it seems very harsh to our modern ears, but we must understand that this was actually a mercy to these people, for without repentance, they would have been held accountable for more sins they would have committed in the days ahead. You think this is harsh? I understand. But note, this happened multiple times in the past. It happened at Noah's flood. It happened at the Exodus in Egypt. And understand, the very same thing will be repeated in the last day. The angel of the Lord and the Lord himself will go out. One day that is coming soon, heaven itself will be emptied. And Jesus will return with 10,000 times 10,000 of his hosts, his armies, his angels. We read in Jude, the Lord will come with his holy ones to bring judgment, to execute judgment on all. He will not come by proxy on that day. He will come in person to convict the ungodly of their deeds and ungodliness, which they have committed and the harsh things ungodly sinners have spoken against him. Jesus, who often talked about love, also said, one day, Matthew 13, the Son of Man will send his angels. They will gather out of all his kingdom the causes of sin and the lawbreakers and throw them into the fiery furnace where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Brothers and sisters, this is the reality for those who reject God. He laughs today and he will have the last laugh one day at their cruelty and hatred and rejection of him. He weeps over their sin, but if they continue to rebel against them, he will bring his justice to account. People all the time are saying, if there's a loving God, why doesn't he stop the rapists and the murderers and the thieves and the extortioners and the, the criminals on Wall Street and the dictators and the, the evil people of the world? He will one day, brothers and sisters. He will deal with all sin, but he's also going to deal with the liars and the blasphemers and the adulterers and the thieves and those who have been of low character and unsound mind in the way they have treated others. Brothers and sisters, we must remember God is just. And so Sennacherib gets away. He thinks that he's made it without getting the judgment of God. He goes back home to his capital city of Nineveh. And notice here, he thinks, I got away from Yahweh. Yahweh got my people. He didn't get me. He's not humbled. He's not brokenhearted. And he goes into the temple of his God to worship. And he thought, surely at that moment, I'm in the safest place I can be in the temple of Nisroch, my God. I'm in my capital city. I'm in my temple to my God. Yahweh couldn't touch me because I'm so good. And yet Sennacherib's God could not protect him in the place he felt most safe. Notice, he could not even be protected in his own temple from his own two sons who murdered him terribly at that moment. Brothers and sisters, if this statement of the justice of God is shocking to you, I want to push it one step further. See, God takes sin and rebellion and hatred of him so seriously that he not only brought justice on Egypt and justice on the Assyrians and justice on Sennacherib, and not only will he one day bring justice on all the wicked of this world, but brothers and sisters, he poured out the justice that we deserve on his son. The execution of his only son in order to exalt his name and deliver his people. Reformation consists in trusting in the Lord first and foremost. Listen to Romans 3. All of us have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And are justified by his grace as a gift. How? Through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God put forward as a propitiation by his blood to be received by faith. That was to show God's righteousness, his justice, because in his divine patience, his forbearance, he has passed over former sins. God brought justice to the enemies of his people. But he brings justice to us. 
He passes over your sins, your evil, my sins and my evil by bringing justice on his son on the cross. That's what God did for you because of his love for you. So I ask you today as we close, is God laughing at your rebellion or has he covered your sin and passed over it at the cross of Jesus Christ? Look to Jesus Christ today and be saved. Let us pray. 